afternoon. Hey. I see that you're visiting Kitty Wan, same as I am. You know, I'm just now starting to write down my recollections of the war. And I thought I could visit my old school here at Kitty Wan, and that might help refresh some memories a little bit. But I tell you, when I think back, the memories come to me in crowds, and I try to sort them out. So it's kind of hard to do, but I thought, you know, for my family and my sons, they might be interested in what I did in that war. I should at least try. Now, I'm no historian, so I may not get all the names right or exactly when things happened, but I'm going to do my best to kind of put things down the way I remember it. Would you like to hear a couple things that I'm going to write about? Yeah. Yeah, there's a, a few things that come to mind, and one of them, the reason I came to Kitty Wong, is that it would be a little over 20 years ago that I attended school at Kitty Wong. And that would have been the winter of 1861, or 60, and the spring of 1861. And that was when people were talking about secession. And Dr. Selden owned the place. Now, he was a fine old Southern gentleman, but he's also what you'd call a fire. You heard that term before? Well, they use that now to talk about somebody that was so excited about secession. And then when the war came, so sure that the war would be short and successful, that that was everything they talked about. And that was the way Dr. Selden was. I'll tell you, when we went to school until July that year, we had war for breakfast, dinner, and supper. But he wasn't the only one. He had a, a his brother-in-law formed the Charles City Troop. Now that was a company of cavalry and it was formed from around here. Now, Dr. Sheldon's oldest son joined that troop of cavalry. And so early on, he was writing letters back, and Mrs. Sheldon would sit right up there on the porch, and she would read those letters. And I would sit there on the stairs and listen about these stories of army life. And I thought they were so wonderful and exciting. It was better than anything he wrote in school. I was excited too. I thought I should volunteer and join up. But the problem was I wasn't 18. I wasn't going to be 18 until that October. And my parents said no. The law was you had to be 18. Well, we did see some of the other fellows volunteering and we got a half day holiday to go down and accompany some of the troops down to Wayne Oak Wharf. And I had a friend and kinsman who was older, or he was younger than I was. And in spite of that, he went and joined them. Now he came back about two days later. I don't know if they found out that he wasn't 18, or maybe he figured out that this wasn't for him. But he did join up about a year or so later. I think when he figured out that there was work to be done and not a holiday to be enjoyed. But that wasn't unusual. A lot of people were excited. They didn't know how long it would last. They thought it would be short. Yes, many folks just forgot what war would be like. <coughs> but that didn't matter a whole lot. At that point, I still was determined that when I was 18, I was going to join. And when I did turn 18, I thought, you know, I'd like to join the cavalry. There's one problem there as well. You know what you need if you want to join the cavalry. A horse. We had horses. My father wasn't going to give me a horse. So I thought, okay, well, I can't join the cavalry then. And I was waiting around to see what my other opportunities might be. I heard that the militia was forming up. Now, once you're 18, you're automatically in the militia. So I was able to go. So I went as fast as I could to the captain, and I said, I'm 18. Oh, yeah. Okay. So then they mustered me in, and we went down to Jamestown Island. Oh. Now that's when I learned really what soldiering was like. It was drill, drill, drill. Now, fortunately, I got very good at that, so they made me a sergeant. But we didn't see much going on on the island, but every once in a while, the colonel would form us up, and he would march us at the double click down to the other side of the island, thinking that maybe the Yankees were there and they were landing. And every time we did that, 
There was nothing there. Now, I was fortunate enough that as a sergeant, I had a horse that I could use to check the different guard posts. So I'd ride along. I didn't have to march to back and forth like that. But that was pretty much what we did, is prepare for something that, as it turned out, didn't happen, at least not then. But there is one amusing story that I have to tell you to show you just how bored soldiers can get in camp. With nothing else going on in the island, as it turned out, my best friend in the world, Hawes Coleman, he was quite a runner. And we decided that we would put up a call across the island to see if there was anybody who could beat my friend Coleman in a foot race at 150 yards. A number of men tried. It was uh, money placed on the outcome just to make it a little interesting. And I remember there was one case where a fellow had $40 on it. it was a lot of money. He ran about 30 yards and then just stopped and quit. Hoss was so far ahead of me, he said, there is no way I can catch that man Coleman. And he just gave up. Now, it was, no one was willing to race Coleman after that, so we thought, well, maybe we can get him to race a horse. <laughs> Coleman said, okay. But his stipulation was that you had to turn the horse's head to the side until he said go. And you know, he did that several times, and he beat the horse every time. Now after that, unfortunately, the militia was broke up. A number of us, we'd grown so close, we were gonna join up together and form a company. But we couldn't decide on whether we wanted to be infantry, or artillery, or cavalry. So after discussing it a long time, recruiters came through the camp and plucked men up one by one. And before we knew it, everybody had signed up for what seemed like a, a different company or regiment. And I thought around and decided, well, maybe I'll go home and see what prospects I can find there. Now, Coleman, his father died about that time. So he went home to take care of the farm and his mother. So as it turned out, my father was willing to give me a horse this time. So that's when I went to find the Charles City Troop. Now, they were part of the 3rd Virginia Cavalry, known as Company D. And when I joined up with them, McClellan was coming down the peninsula here, near Williamsburg. And so it was my first task to be a courier. So what I got to do was ride along with the general and then carry messages back and forth. It's a really nice job to have. For one, we learned whether you had a message or not, as long as you had a horse and a large envelope and you were moving fast enough, nobody would stop you anyway. So we got to go pretty much where we wanted to go. But there was one time that it, I was riding with this fellow, General John B. Magruder. You ever heard of him? Fine, fine old gentleman. In fact, some folks called him Gentleman John. We called him Old Patty. And he'd been in Mexico. So he knew his task. So I was riding with him, and when I was riding with him, that's where I saw some of my real firsts of the war. Now, for example, was riding along in case he needed any dispatches taken, and that's when the, I saw my first Yankee gun unlimbered, off on a hillside in the distance. And I was so fascinated, never seen him do that before, and I was watching, and I noticed the smoke. That's the first time I saw a shell whistle over my head and explode. Now shortly after that, we were riding towards our lines, and then I saw the dirt kicked up in front of my horse, Rosa. Well, that was the first time I'd ever been shot at by sharpshooters. So we rode behind the trenches, and old Patty was inspiring the men, and they gave up a rebel yell. First time I heard that. Probably the first time the Yankees heard it too, because they responded with gunfire from their cannon. And those shells were bursting overhead at us. Now, fortunately, at that point in the war, they were shooting high. So we didn't lose any men. We lost one horse and another one. With so much excitement, the fellow rode his horse over a stack of tent poles, injured the horse, snagged him up a good bit. Other than that, we kept on going until I was walking my horse, and that was the first time that I'd ever been fired at with shot. Now, shot and shell are two different things. 
When the shot hit, it hit about six feet in front, picking up wood chips and dirt. And that was the first time I saw a man killed instantly. Because there were infantry lying over on the hill across, and one of those men was hit by shot. And I tell you, when the stretcher bearers came over, I saw them pick up his body, put it on the stretcher, then pick up his head, put it on the stretcher. It wasn't the last time I'd see that. In fact, one of the fellows in my company, he said it wasn't the shell that he was afraid of, it was that terrible fine shot. Because you know, a shell is hollow and it'll burst above you. But that shot's just an iron ball. I also remember it was near Malvern House that they were using the house as a hospital. And I saw a pile of arms and legs where the surgeons had been amputated. And the nurses and doctors were rushing around. You know, I saw some grim things. But there also were some lighthearted moments too. Some things that when I, I think back, they're so fantastic that even I can't believe they happened. So I'll, I'll finish up with one of the more amusing stories, the story of my would-be capture. Now this was at Brandy Station, and we camped there several times. But this time, we were camping, and a shell burst in an oak tree, and we all looked around and we saw a squadron, a Yankee cavalry coming straight at us, bearing down. Now I did, only thing I thought I could do, I grabbed my rifle, I ran into a nearby shop. So I sat there looking out the doorway, waiting for those blue bellies to come by so I could take a shot at one of them. And that's when I heard a voice say, surrender, sir. I looked around and there was a cocked pistol pointed right at my head where the Yankee stretched through the, sh the window of the shop. And he said, drop your pistol and your rifle. So I did so. Then he took me out and got on his horse, pulled me alongside, taking me down a railroad track. We got down that track a little bit and then another voice said, surrender, sir. This time, it was a rebel lieutenant from the second Virginia Cavalry. And I said, I'm a Confederate. Tell this man to give me my pistol and his horse. The lieutenant did that, got up on the horse, grabbed a hold of my prisoner now. The lieutenant rode off. Well, we were riding along, and then I came across another Yankee just standing there with no weapon. So I took him along too, and I had two prisoners. I was riding down the road, and I saw some horsemen in front of me, and I thought, okay, I'll ride straight up to them. So I'm riding up with my prisoners in tow, and the fellow says, Surrender, sir. I said, they've already surrendered. He said, surrender, sir. I looked down at one of my prisoners, and I said, I think those are Yankees. And he said, yes, they're all Yankees. It's <laughs> so that point that I let go of my prisoner, and I grabbed a hold of that Yankee horse, and I so sweetly persuaded him to turn rebel. And he turned around the other way and went as fast as he could as the bullets went whizzing by me. And I didn't stop till I came up on a hill and I saw some of Stewart's artillery unlimbering and a company of the 3rd Virginia right there standing guard and I rode right up to them. It's about that time that I was going through the saddlebags of the horse to see what might be in it. A good friend of mine, Dick Christian, just comes walking up, he's looking at the ground, he looks at me, he walks up to me and he says, I thought you were in Washington. Well. I wasn't in Washington, but I did get to keep, keep that horse by order of headquarters, and I took him home with me. Now I know that even as I'm telling these stories that they may sound fantastic, and sometimes I don't necessarily believe that people will take them as truth, so I don't always tell them. But I swear, I swear in front of a notary, that's what happened. And I tell you, I'm glad that I visited Kitty Wong to help relive these memories a little bit. Hope you're enjoying your visit too. Take care.